Okay, hello everyone. We are today here with Josh at Conior at the Nuri Enactment, and he's an expert on Volvo 2 Armor.org. And we're standing in front of a 105 Sherman. And what often comes up is usually that people complain why the US forces didn't went into Normandy with a 76 mm gun mainly employed. And he brought up some very interesting data that actually the troops, for the most part, preferred the 75 mm. Correct. So there's a, there's a little bit of information there to unpack. Um, the 75 millimeter has some very interesting attributes that the troops actually preferred and thought were really cool. Um, if you wanted to engage enemy armor, obviously the 76 millimeter would be the one to, to use for it. They found in North Africa, when it was on um, the ballistically identical three inch gun, it could penetrate the front of a Tiger I from a distance of about 1,300, 1,500 yards. That's in both ballistics reports done by the, the US and the British, and then it's also in uh, after action and combat reports uh, by US tank destroyer battalions. Um, so the 76 millimeter three inch gun was a very good gun, at least in terms of uh, a 1943, 1944 gun for anti-tank use. But when they tried to offer it to the tankers that were going over into Europe, a lot of them were not interested in it. And there's a very intriguing reason why. A lot of that has to do with target analysis. So in 1951, there was a study done, um, it, the document is Aura T117. It was done taking a look at comprehensive result of, of tank combat during World War II. And as part of that, they studied what were tankers shooting at. And they found some very interesting statistics. Um, one of the big ones was that during World War II, they found in the ETO, only about 14, 14.7% of the time were they actually shooting at enemy tanks and enemy uh, armored fighting vehicles. Um, most of the time, they were actually shooting at everything else, fortifications, bunkers, infantry, so on and so forth. So basically, a lot of times you always think, you do various computer games and those movies, that tanks were fighting tanks all the time in World War II, which is inaccurate, and also the Wehrmacht is always portrayed as this mighty force with Panthers, but also in 1944 they had way less already. Also right. the logistical situation due to interdiction and everything was quite different. So. U.S. troops were mainly fighting infantry and fortified positions. Well, they were fighting some tanks, but what were they? What they were fighting and what they were, you know, what was heavily armored to be an, a, a problem was not nearly as what you think. When you take a look at, say, like how many Tiger ones were deployed in in, in hot zones that had Tigers. For example, Zaloga quotes in Patton's and the Pan versus the Panzers. He thinks about 60 Tigers at any one time in North Africa and Italy which they had several battalions deployed over there. And you look, when they, were, when they were deployed, like for example in Sicily, they deployed 17 Tigers and they lost them literally in the space of a yeah. day or two. So basically uh, a Tiger heavy battalion was about 45 tanks. Mm -hmm. Nominal strength, how many then were operational, is like something completely different again. So if you're fighting like two or three battalions, at most you have 90 to 135 Tigers at most right. as opposition. But then, yeah, it's becoming less. Right, and if you take like the Panther, which was one of the other significant threats, they think about 300 to 450 Panthers were actually operational in the European theater of operations. Still running the numbers on that one. But um, of those, we have to ask how many of them were actually able to show up for fighting. So if there's 350, 400 different Panthers in, in theater, some of them are gonna be in maintenance depots, some are gonna be held in reserve, some are gonna be on the front lines, some of them are gonna be being repaired. How many are actually going to show up in battle, especially when you look at the U.S. logistics and realize that about, on some days, they were, they were filling as high as like 2,000 uh, Sherman tanks per army group. So if they could show up and contest an area of ground with a tank, they'd win by yeah. default. I mean, he who shows up with tanks is going to win. But to that point, there's an interesting thing that a lot of people forget about when it comes to U.S. tank guns. So in 1946, they did a, a, a look at U.S. Or US uh, high explosive artillery, which is interesting because around 80% of the rounds fired during World War II were high explosive, either smoke or high explosive, and that was on all sides, US, British, Canadian, German, they were all shooting a lot of high explosives. Yeah. And if you wanted to, sl to sling HE at somebody, which tank gun would you want? This In one. the background here, I have a 105 millimeter, and obviously that would be the one I would totally want, but why? Why would I want that? So if you take a look and you run the numbers of that, the study took, and they took an artillery shell, they put it in the center of a testing range, they blew it up, and then they counted in a 20-foot radius all the shrapnel that could produce a casualty. And they counted it up, and there was some really interesting takeaways of it. 
So obviously, if you wanted to cause shrapnel casualties, you would do so with 105 millimeter. They had around 1,010 shrapnel pieces that they were able to count and say that these could produce a casualty in a 20 foot radius. That's why the 105 was so successful against, say, uh, anti-tank guns, because you hit anywhere close to it, you're yeah. obviously gonna kill off some of the crew. But the surprise second place comes into the 75 millimeter. Because it's also a howitzer, it's a short barrel, low velocity gun, you can have a larger, longer shell that holds more HE filler. And that one came in just behind the 105 millimeter at 950 pieces of shrapnel in that 20 foot radius. Now they obviously tested other guns too because they were curious about this. And the 90 came in in third place at 672 pieces of shrapnel in that 20 foot uh, circle. And the worst performer out of all of them was the 76 millimeter, which came in at 560 pieces of shrapnel. So less 560, than a half. less than half of that of the of the 75 millimeter. So if you're shooting at what the normal target was for uh, for a, sol or a tanker of World War II, you're going to be shooting at you know enemy vehicles, half tracks. You're going to be shooting at uh, soldiers, fortifications, bunkers. The gun that you wanted in most of those cases was probably going to be the 75 millimeter or the 105 millimeter. Not that the 76 wasn't a bad gun, it's just it was more designed to defeat the armor. Armor that theoretically was or was not there in the numbers that might, some people might think about. Yeah, I mean, I know that the British did in their, their tank platoons, they added one usually with a, a Sherman Firefly or a long belt. Mm -hmm. Did the US forces did the same? Um, not in the not in the same way that the Firefly did. They did try and reload or rearm people with the 76 millimeters, but then they also had uh, support with the tank destroyer groups. So the tank destroyers were designed to be kind of held in reserve. Now, obviously, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So yeah. they found in you know Normandy they were short of tanks. So let's use tank destroyers. It looks like a tank. It clanks like a tank. It you know puts around like a tank. So those commanders are like, let's throw it into frontline combat in the in the hedgerows of Normandy didn't turn out so well. Yeah, I made a video about that one. <laughs> right, right, it didn't turn out so well, but it was still successful in that role. And they, they, they did have that if they needed a little bit more oomph in order to do that. And that's not to say that they didn't react to that in the meantime. They were testing as early as 1942, they were testing mounting a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft gun onto, a, uh, onto a, a, a platform that they could use, which didn't see fruition for many reasons one way or another. It didn't see fruition until 1944 when you had the M36 Jackson. Now, obviously, the ideal for the tank destroyer was one of the other vehicles we have in the collection, which was the M18 Hellcat, which had the 76 millimeter gun. Again, designed for that fast, can go up to 55, mil or 55 miles per hour in combat conditions, has torsion bar suspension, made by Buick. Apparently, they made more than just cars, but um, it was kind of the ideal that the Hellcat or that the tank destroyer branch was looking for. So, and also, we should not forget. You also have hollow charge shells, as you pointed out before. You yes. can use the, the hollow charge shell on the 105. Of course, it, it has several disadvantages because hollow charge usually has a very high... Very steep arc. Yeah, yep. steep arc of uh, trajectory and everything, but the penetration value is also very high. Yeah, and one, one issue they didn't realize is because these are howitzers, they're still a rifled barrel. They didn't realize at the time that you kind of uh, diminish the hollow charge effectiveness if you impart spin to it. Ah, yeah. So they kind of fudge themselves a little bit. Now that's not, to, that's not to say that they didn't have success with it. They found out uh, when they were testing it in, in, in combat, there are, rep, or there are examples in late 1944 of the howitzer armed tanks taking out um, a Panther frontally. I believe they hit it like either in the front or in the mantlet. Um, and that was about six to eight inches of armor. It, it had a very, very effective heat shell. Yeah, and also with heat shells, I mean, this is pointed out in, a, in, a, in the Stuck, in the Stuck School video, that the Germans noted, okay, the disadvantage is the, the high, steep trajectory, but you can also use a heat shell against the infantry to a certain degree, because it's also explosive, high Correct. explosive anti-tank, as the name yes. implies. So, which also fits there. So, in, in doubt, you shoot there and you probably kill something or damage something. Correct, and actually there's, a, there's an interesting story about HE. So, um, in Africa, North Africa, most of the British tanks up to that time, the, they had the two-pounder gun, uh, which is a great gun, and um, it had an HE shell, but it wasn't commonly used. And if it wasn't commonly used, it wasn't actually issued a lot. Apparently it was enough that, that um, people from, from World War II thought it was fairly rare, or they hadn't seen it, um, if, you look at the, if you look at memoirs. Um, 
interestingly enough, one of the first vehicles to introduce that was the M3 Lee, which was armed with the same 75 millimeter gun, which gave them tremendous HE uh, capability, which they used in that same thing. They were able to take out anti-tank guns from a fair distance away without fear of reprisal like they hadn't previously because you had to have a direct hit if you have a solid AP projectile. Yeah. You have to hit on the shield or you have to hit somebody. With an HE, actually gunnery manuals from World War II teach uh, a near miss is almost as good. You can actually skip a shot. Yeah. So you can do a super quick fuse or you can do a timed fuse, a time delay. Yeah. And if you aim short, you can skip the shot up and have it burst yeah, overhead. Bounce, yeah. Yeah, and actually they taught that. It, there's a fair amount of almost field artillery uh, usage that's taught to the tankers of the day. Ah, that's interesting. I mean, this is very interesting. I did a, on, on my German World War II artillery tactics video. Basically, they had the bouncing shell as well. Of course, mm -hmm. it's more of an artillery part. And also, like, for the Sturmgeschütz, they know that in the destruction in Leafland, use delayed fuse, ideally, and mine effect. So basically, yes. the, the, the shell penetrates and explodes Mine effect Below. was found to be less effective. Now, statistically speaking, that same study we looked at earlier, which was Aura T117, um, they found that hollow charge only accounted for about 7.5% of German armored vehicles that were recovered. The startling interesting piece about that too is that was about the same number that uh, aircraft accounted for. Everybody thinks of these fighter bombers knocking yeah. out German tanks. But they didn't. They, they found that about 40% were knocked out via gunfire and about 40% were either scuttled or abandoned and lost because the Germans lost control of the battlefields. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the, the, the fire bomber moved this. There's actually a back and forth. There might be... Uh, the, the main effect was, was the psychological effect. Already in, in 1939 and 1940, the Germans noted even against artillery, the French artillery, that the destructive effect of their Stuka attacks mm -hmm. was limited. Yes. They said the physical effect was limited, but it pointed out the suppression effect yes. is devastating. So basically, that with close air support, it had a major impact, yes, but it did. not on the destructive side of you sometimes see in movies and computer games. Because, well, there you have to do something more for the effect, basically, or for the gameplay mechanics. But in, in reality, moral is usually not very well portrayed in computer games mm -hmm. for understandable reasons. Yeah. Well, as we pointed out earlier, um, if you can show up to a battlefield with a tank, then you can contest said battlefield. If you yeah. show up with infantry and your, your enemy shows up with tanks, it's not going to be much of a, a contest. That being said, one thing that air, air support was very effective in was, as you mentioned, interdiction of supplies moving on, on the fields. They were under harassment constantly. They yeah. were blowing up locomotives. They were strafing the, the, the fields. Now, they didn't account for that many knocked out, you look at the British reports, they did one where they you know, took a, a stationary panther and tried yeah. to blow it up with a Hawker Hurricane and, and missed it. Like uh, out of 100 times, they hit it three times. Yeah, yeah. David Willey talked about this uh, when we were at the Tank Museum. And I think he mentioned something along the lines. They also had a bunny inside or something. Right. And he was, and then, then they looked at the bunny and the bunny was just munching around <laughs> along. So, so this, is, this is quite interesting to see. But the funny thing is, recently I talked with Dr. Roman Töppel and he noted something that with the cannon-armed planes, there actually might be more hits than originally thought. But so it's like, I see this more and more, there's myth, and yep. there's a counter myth, and then you look again and then, oh, there's actually some more detail to it. Right. But, but I'm not sure on this yet. But I think we cover already a lot of ground. Yes, thank you so much. So thank you very much, Josh. My pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to work with us today. Thank you very much. And be sure to check out the homepage and probably a YouTube page at one point. Absolutely, thank you. So thank you for watching and see you next time, bye. This video was made possible by Wargaming, who transported me to the event and provided accommodation and further support throughout my time there, especially by attaching me to Nicholas the Chieftain Moran. Thank you for your excellent support.